Hello, and welcome to our podcast. For the last three years, Hope Church South Bedfordshire here in the UK has had people meeting on weekdays to discuss God's Word together. We've moved this discussion onto this podcast so others in our congregation, our area, and the wider world can enjoy God's Word along with us. In this episode, we're looking at the book of Mark in the New Testament, and we expect as we read, God will teach us and we will help each other learn more. As you listen to the prayer, the reading, the discussion, while you're listening, ask God to reveal things to your heart. The book of Mark was written so that you would come to know who Jesus is, and our desire is that we will all come to know him better as we look at this together. Good morning, and welcome to our podcast this morning. And this morning we were looking at Mark 11, uh, verses 20 to 33, and we've had a very kind offer of Bob praying and faith reading for us. Dear Lord, we thank you for uh, another opportunity to read your word, to study your word, and to learn from you and to understand more about you and your ways. And we pray that we will absorb these things and uh, they will become part of our lives, Lord. Teach us new things, Lord, today. Amen. Amen. The withered fig tree. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you have cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. The authority of Jesus questioned. They arrived again in Jerusalem and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask them, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Thank you both. And um, <clears throat> we're coming to this. There's a bit of background we need to just put in place in case you're joining us uh, for the first time this morning. Um, Jesus has cursed a fig tree on his way into Jerusalem because he found no fruit on it. And then he's gone into the temple courts and found the court of the Gentiles full of trade taking place and people making money off things and a whole load of um, commerce taking place where there shouldn't be. And so he turns over the tables. He he is angry and he um, cha- changes the atmosphere there quite considerably and then teaches into it saying, uh, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. And then after that, they went back to Bethany and this is the next day. They're starting out from Bethany and they pass a fig tree and find the fig tree that Jesus um, spoke to <laughs> has withered within a day. And and actually from that, you know, he uh, they say, oh, look, <laughs> this is what's happened. 
and and Jesus brings us teaching, which I'm sure we'll focus on. Some of these verses are very often taken um, and preached on just on the verse itself without the context, but it's very interesting in its context. Um, also, um, looking at this, Jesus goes into the temple. Now, the day before, he's turned all the tables over. He's upset <laughs> a lot of very powerful people who are making a lot of money off that. But also, he's challenging he challenged their authority. And so th- this is what they confront him with in the temple courts, probably quite loudly. But what authority do you do this? And um, I imagine that's how they did it, because his response was one that left them frightened about the crowds. So I'm guessing they would need a public response to that as well. And so um, we've got this uh, neat um, kind of piece that we're looking at today, um, but incredibly powerful, incredibly insightful. And Jesus, just a few couple of days earlier, had entered Jerusalem on a, a little donkey and the crowds had turned out proclaiming him the Messiah and and saying, Hosanna, save Lord. And shouts of praise, throwing their cloaks in the street for the donkey to walk over and and throwing their, their, their palm trees down on the ground, the leaves of the palm trees down the ground to, to for him to walk and make a path for his feet. There, there's incredible atmosphere in Jerusalem. And I think just as we look at this, we need to sort of have in the back of our minds the atmosphere around the place. There's a lot of things bubbling. There's a lot of things going on. And this is the atmosphere Jesus is speaking into, Jesus is acting upon, Jesus is responding to. He's come like a king into Jerusalem, like the Messiah into Jerusalem, and he's challenged what's not right. And this is where we sort of pick up from. So I'm going to open it up. Talking of the atmosphere, it must have been absolutely electric. All these things happening very uh, quick succession. The um, the triumphant arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem and then this, this strange object lesson of the fig tree, which at first sight seems very odd, doesn't it? Um, Jesus cursing a tree seems to be sort of almost vindictive really that the the tree didn't have any fruit when Jesus was hungry but it it was really an object lesson to everyone wasn't it the uh, the parallel between the fig tree and the temple the fig tree that should have been bearing fruit showed all the signs of bearing fruit but didn't have any fruit when it was uh, examined and the temple that should have been bearing fruit had all the outward appearances, but um, didn't actually bear any positive fruit. It was turned out it was had been turned into just a marketplace trading, a money making scheme. Yeah, I think the fig tree um, has been used in the Old Testament as an illustration of Israel spoken to as an olive tree or a fig tree at times in the various prophet books of the Bible. And so in Isaiah, there's a couple of things that tie in with this. Isaiah says in Isaiah 34, 4, all the host of heaven shall rot away, the skies shall roll up like a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall as the leaves fall from the vine, as the leaves falling from a fig tree. And so that, that's in Isaiah. In Joel 1, it says, in verse 7, It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down, their branches being made white. And Amos 4 says, I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees the locust has devoured, but yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. And so this hunger in Jesus that we're looking at yesterday is, is actually a hunger for fruit in his nation. Um, and he's not seeing it. And these Old Testament prophecies are saying, you know, even, even when it's struck, you don't get the warning of it, that actually it's time to turn to the Lord. There, there's, you know, and, and so in the Old Testament, there's a lot of references to fig trees. And, and in, the, in, in the background of that is hinting that it's judgment on, on 
on Israel. And so in this, there's there's something else going on with this that that's well earthed. And people reading this in the first century um, would have understood a lot of these things because most of the Christians then were from a Jewish background. And so as a result of that, there, there's some very powerful things here of where fruit is found. It's not just in your birth. It's not just in your nationality, but actually it is a relationship with God. And that's where it's coming from. That identity needs to come from there. And um, there's something else being, being brought here, uh, which is pretty powerful. I think the people would have been familiar with fig trees and olive trees they were everyday um, uh, things that they they saw and they were, they knew, so it was a good example to use. Um, and I think there's significance in this tree just withering overnight. One day it was alive, next day it was just a withered um, stump, I suppose. Um, not the sort of thing that naturally happens to trees. I don't think they dr- they die overnight. And I think there's a the lesson here that um, you know the, the judgment would be would be sudden and swift um, and perhaps unexpected. Um, something that the, the people found surprising, I guess, that the this tree that had been alive and vigorous one day was just a withered remains, um, fit only for firewood, really. Not fit for any fruit anymore, but just for being burnt. And I think there's significance in that. Mm. And I think I love the way Jesus kind of leaves that fig tree hanging a little bit. <laughs> because when they come to him and say, look at the fig tree, Lord. I'm like, wow, you only cursed that yesterday. Look at it. <laughs> you know, mm. or oh, I didn't, you know, we've seen healings. We've seen <laughs> demons driven out of people. We've, we've seen, you know, storms calmed. We've seen amazing things. But you, you just spoke to that fig tree on the way past yesterday and look at it, you know. Mm. And then Jesus goes, have faith in God. And he brings the subject onto something else. And it's it's kind of like this, this attitude of faith, of having a trust in God, is where Jesus brings that, um, that understanding. He brings it straight in and says, you know, uh, verse 23, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. And, and and there's that sense of the impossible, um, you know, the kind of the impossibility of just moving mountains, you know, um, are, are possible. And and so a fig tree, forget that. We're on to mountains now. We're on to we're on to something else. There are bigger things that are going to shift and move than a little fig tree. And Jesus is turning the focus, probably preparing them as well. Just wonder, um, yeah, there's a lot going on. I think we have to be careful to look at the whole context of uh, Jesus' teaching on prayer, don't we? Um, He's saying, uh, pray and uh, tell a mountain to move. And we could, um, I think you've used the example in the past of uh, trying to get something to move across a table um, we can we can be misled I think quite easily by not looking at the whole teaching of Jesus on prayer um, about um, asking for things that are God's will uh, not just um, what we want to happen but what what is in line with god's will we have to be careful i think about that uh, and to make sure what we're praying for is in god's will it's what he wants not just what we want i think the the prayer is also connected with our relationship with him not um just asking well but for this and that, or what I would like. And it's a relationship and getting to know what God's heart is 
in in different <clears throat> situations and what yeah. his will is in different situations. Um, and also struck by the bit, and when, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Um, and there's also that aspect that co that comes into it that Jesus is is bringing into the light, really. Um, uh, for the disciples and those that were around him. And for us too. It's talking a lot about the heart as well, isn't it, with this last little piece. He says about the heart, if you've got doubt in your heart, and then he says about forgiving, which mm. is also, if you forgive, it's always about your heart as well, isn't it? Because if your heart's in the right place and you're forgiving, you're in that right, that right space. And it is very much to do with the peace and the, your soul and your heart, I think, that God, he's trying to get through to them about the fig tree can be there one minute and gone the next. And we can be like that. We can, you could be here one minute and we've gone the next. You know, things that aren't, not, they don't sustain this world. And he's trying to prepare them in such a delicate way, really. Uh, I love that. How he, um, he just gently does it, but in a very strong way. Um, makes them work it out for themselves. But Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So, yeah, it's about forgiveness and, and not holding things against people. I know I had to forgive someone and it was really deep. But, you know, the relief that you don't realise how hold it holds you back. And it's not about also, maybe, the forgiveness is part of it, but also the holding on to circumstances will hold you back. And with that becomes that, that heart part again that you feel peace you feel you feel like um i suppose you feel like a new heart within you because you've turned and uh, and made a choice to forgive it's, just, it's very strong about this forgiveness aspect isn't it as if, as if uh, forgiveness blocks the line of communication between us and god it's um cuts off cuts off the telephone line if you like that sort of thing it's it's he's he's that strong about it um that if we have for, uh, um, unforgiveness in our hearts um it blocks the communication and as you were saying sue it, it, it affects us mm. um it has a negative effect on us if we're harboring sort of unforgiveness resentment perhaps that goes along with it um, a grudge, all these things, it can, it can prevent us from moving on. It can hold us back and can be a blockage in our lives. So I think, I think that's why Jesus emphasizes it so strongly, um, as an important, well, very important thing in prayer to forgive. Yeah, I guess prayer <clears throat> is communicating with God about things um, around us and and situations so we, we pray to god and we we, we talk to him um and so in prayer in some ways that approach to god is in faith it's a putting our trust in god it's not just oh we'll do that because it might be a lucky thing for us it's mm -hmm. it's actually a trust thing but it's also in other what passage of the scripture it says to pray in the name of jesus and the name of someone sums up their whole character their whole personality their whole mission and so when we pray we pray in line with who jesus is it's a continuation of his ministry it's a continuation of what he saw on earth it's a continuation of his heart and his desires and our prayers in line with that, in the name of Jesus, is not a tag on to a prayer. It's actually <coughs> as a continuation of your ministry, as a continuation of what you're doing in the earth. This is why we pray. And I'm guess I'm not. It shouldn't surprise us that the continuation of His ministry needs to include us <laughs> and our attitudes and our hearts and how we are in how we pray. 
And so, so there, there's, it, it, it also has a knock on effect into how we are. Are we representing Jesus? Have, have, are, have we got unforgiveness? Are we all angry at different people for no reason at all? Actually, there, there's a need to address that and pray. And there, there's a connection and it's all interconnected. It, it's, it's wonderful. It's a relational. It, it's not, it's not a formula. In previous passages, we've seen people coming to Jesus and falling down at his feet. Um, and I, I've never really thought about the importance of that before. It's, it's just a sign of humility and being subject to, to his authority. It, it, it represents all sorts of things. And, um, it's taught me, I think, the importance of coming, coming to Jesus with the right attitude, coming with a humble heart, coming with um, humble requests rather than demands uh, to plead with him sometimes. We've seen examples of that, uh, people coming to Jesus to plead with him, to have mercy on them or to have mercy on their child or somebody else and i think that's a lesson for us yeah i'm conscious also of the powerfulness of prayer because you engage god in things and his great power um there's a story of george muller who needed to be somewhere for a meeting and there was a heavy sea fog and no ships were sailing and he needed to go and he was he really needed to get there so he said to the captain come come down into your cabin and let's pray and he knelt down on the floor played paid prayed a simple childlike prayer saying lord come clear the fog and so on and the captain next to him is trying to think of how to pray and <laughs> and about to try and pray with him and he goes don't don't worry you don't believe what you're about to pray and god has already answered and they went up onto the deck and the fog was clearing and the boat sailed with the tide and you know there's some very powerful things we've we've hear of in church history but we also know in our own lives where we prayed for things that seemed impossible and seen god bring it about in powerful dynamic ways and so this mm -hmm. this passage should spur us on um and and probably spurred the new testament church on like nothing there is nothing impossible you know they're, they're oppressed by a roman state they're oppressed by all the persecution that went on in the early church and and with all there's, there's nothing impossible stay joyous guys stay free stay happy um you know and 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 you know there's some very powerful dynamics to this passage um we haven't touched very much on the um confrontation with the uh, jewish leaders today <laughs> um mm. but but that's in the passage as well and i think they are confronting jesus probably because of his turning over of the tables in the temple courts and they're probably quite angry about it uh, in in their ad addressing of him but his clever replies just incredible I think they were desperate because they could see their authority slipping away um, and they they really didn't know how to how to stop it um, that's why they asked Jesus this very direct question by what authority are you doing these things and Jesus gave this very wise answer uh, by asking them a question um, and once again, they were, they couldn't answer. But the only thing that I think stopped them answering was their own pride and status and all the rest of it that they were holding on to. The very problem itself was the reason they couldn't speak because they didn't, they, were, they would lose political power. They would lose the very thing they were clinging on to and willing to kill Jesus for. <laughs> um, they'd have had to let go of all of that to actually admit John, John was a prophet or to say they didn't believe. And then the people say, well, why, why can you not even recognize that? And you think you're someone spiritual. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a real, but in, in my notes, it says um, here on the side of my Bible, it basically says they didn't have the capacity to tell that John's ministry was from God. How on earth could they tell <laughs> that Jesus's ministry was from God? Mm -hmm. Except that.
And so they wouldn't have accepted it either way, regardless of what he said. Um, so it's a very good answer. Um, but they 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 snagged on their own prejudice, which is interesting. And they were afraid of the crowd as well, weren't they? It says they feared the people. Um, they were losing the respect of the people. And this made them frightened. What else would they have if they if the people uh, didn't trust their authority? Um, that was all they had. We're getting near the end. I think it'd be good just to look. What do we feel God's saying to us from this passage today? What is it that He's stirring our hearts with? It'd be good to share some of that because we can look at the study, we can look at the means, we can even look at examples of how it works in our lives. But what do we feel God saying to us? I think it's saying to me, I can trust God. Simple mm. as that. Um, for me, I think it's including God in in, in everything, every aspect mm. of my life and and him being involved in it. And um I, and asking him really to give me his eyes to see what he sees yeah. um in everyday life, in everyday and I think for me just in, in the small things and the big things, but also knowing that he knows us intimately and we have that conversation. And as you know, it's a bit like the, a faith as small as a mustard seed. It isn't, about, you know, it's about the belief and that it is Jesus that, that is the head of the <laughs> head of the helm, shall we say? Um, mm. Not about us. It's nothing about. It's all about trust. Nothing for me. <laughs> It's a reminder that nothing is impossible for God, that nothing is um, off, the, off the table <laughs> as far as he's concerned. And so often we can not, not necessarily believe, oh, yeah, God couldn't do that. But we live as though he couldn't. We think as though he couldn't. And I just feel stirred. Just think God can turn anything around. When you're surrounded by powerful things happening in the world, all turmoil all over the place. You think, oh, wow, you know, oh, I wonder if this, you know, you can feel like a pawn in the game. But when you realize that nothing is impossible for God, he can bring his purposes about so easily and so powerfully. Um, mm. it, it's it's something just to keep in mind. And I feel stirred by that today. So thank you all for meeting together. Sorry, did you have something else, Bob? We'll, we'll leave it there. But thank you, everybody, for your comments. And uh, God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to find out more about Hope Church South Bedfordshire, you can find that off our website, www.hopecentral.co.uk. Also, you may like to visit us. We meet at a lovely old church uh, built in 1220 uh, in Tillsworth, part of Dunstable uh, wider area. And um, you're welcome to visit us. We meet at half 10 in the morning and you'd be most welcome to attend and meet us there. Or alternatively, you can find us uh, broadcasting live on our YouTube channel which is also under Hope Church, South Bedfordshire. Thank you very much for joining us. Hope God blessed you loads.